announcements that we need to, to go over with everyone before we get into our worship time. Um, in the back, there is a couple new things. There is a gift bag on this table to the west. Uh, it says Cassidy on it, and that is for anybody who's wanting to give the gift cards or cards of encouragement or things to help Cassidy and their family during this time. So please know that bag's over there. Um, on this side is a playpen, and as many people know, Bright, uh, yeah, Bryce and uh, Casey Yoder's baby is due March 19th, so we're doing a diaper shower. And so any sizes, newborn, to up to two or threes, because they're going to use them, um, please bring them and just set them in that playpen back there. Um, we're going to try and get all these done before or collected before the baby's here, so that way they can have all that ready. Also in the front up here, we're collecting for Lake James Camp, um, so that's going to be up here. So we have three things we're collecting right now. Um, Cassidy, the Yoder's baby, and then Lake James over here. Um, one thing we just uh, periodically want to remind and just encourage everybody, if you need to wear a mask, if you feel that you need to wear a mask, please feel free to do so. If somebody is wearing a mask, we ask everybody else to be respectful and responsible. So if they're wearing a mask, don't go up into their space, and maybe don't go into anybody's face Anyway, because some people don't like it, okay? I, I, I'll back off because I don't care. But please remember to be respectful and courteous to everybody and, um, and share love and all that. And the last thing I, I want to say, we are um, having a meal prepared for Jackie as she's going through these chemo treatments. And so once a week, we're going to provide a meal for her and Larry to just encourage them and all that. And so if you want to be on this meal thing. Please see Casey. Uh, we're going to set that up. She's already got dates. We've been talking to Jackie. So if you want to be a part of that, please uh, see Casey about that. So we're going to go into prayer and then just jump into worship. God, we thank you. We thank you that we have the resources that we can support and encourage our, our fellow believers and love on them as you have loved on us. Lord, as we gather here right now, we ask that you just fill this place with your presence. Let your Holy Spirit invade our hearts and let the phrases on our lips reach into the throne room of heaven. God, we praise you. We thank you. And as we all stand and as we all rise to come into the throne to praise you, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Day, everyone. First Corinthians 13, 13. And now these things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Valentine's Day, the day of love. 
I'm assuming all the men here got their wives a heartfelt card, flowers, chocolates, and maybe even some of you overachieving husbands got your lucky lady some jewelry. Um, if you haven't seen my shirt yet, please take a moment and do so. Yep. Read it and weep, fellas. I've done a good job this year. The title is rightfully mine. Shed no tears as always next year. Anyways, the word love is constantly used by most people. It's used to describe our deep affection, not just for our wives, but our children, parents, relatives, friends, and even our pets. It's also used to describe our desire for unimportant things like cars, sports teams, extra, uh, extracurricular activities, foods, movies, music, and the list goes on. Unfortunately, the word love is thrown around quite recklessly. If you look, look up the word love in the dictionary, it reads, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection. Which, if you go by that definition, I guess you could use it in reference for something you really enjoy. But before we do that, I think we need to take a step back and understand how God wants us to truly understand what real love is. To find results, I quickly typed the word love in the search engine on my Bible app, figuring it would get me specifically to what God's definition would be. But I became quickly overwhelmed at the mass amounts of results that came up. Um, as soon as I started looking through them, though, I immediately found what I needed. It was in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. It reads, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that he, we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but He loved us and set His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So, God is love. And the only way we can know how true love feel is through Him. Communion is the time we can go to God. It's the time we can open our hearts and truly know Him. Let's, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we partake communion, let us come to You and open our hearts so we can know what pure love is. May we learn true love through You so we, make, so we can show the rest of the world what love truly is. In Your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. There is no junior church today, so kids, um, there are those coloring books back there, and if you fill out the bulletin, kids, you get a piece of candy for that. Uh, just wanted to do that. I think we all need to uh, just acknowledge uh, the craziness of Amanda to give Nick that shirt. Okay. <laughs> So, she got a car. So, that's, fellas, what it takes to buy that t-shirt. I, I, she got a car and jewelry. I thought I did good by getting a Yeti mug. Thanks, Nick, for putting us all to shame. Yeah. And Nick is no longer invited to any of our games. So, um, an engineer who worked for General Motors wanted to show his friend the plant. And so he took him there, and this plant at that time was over a mile long, this building was. Um, and, and he told him, he says, raw materials come in on this side, and on the other side, a car comes out. That building exists 
for one purpose, to make cars. Something similar can and should be said about the church. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. According to these verses, according to the command of Jesus, the church is to make disciples. That's the purpose of it. Now, we saw this a couple years ago in our theme of discipleship. Today, right now, thousands of churches are meeting across the world. But the question is, are the churches fulfilling this command? Are they fulfilling, accomplishing this purpose? Are churches making disciples? Now, I've stated many times that a healthy church will grow. It's obvious God has said this in His Scripture. When people are doing God's work, they're following their Father's business of living pure lives, of sharing the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, giving of their time, treasures, and talents uh, to lovingly serve one another and the community, the church will grow. It's a byproduct of healthy, authentic discipleship. However, a church can also grow numerically without any of those things. It will grow as people flock to sit in air-conditioned, spacious facilities, send their kids to exciting children's ministries, hear awesome-sounding choirs or praise groups and bands, and watch a tear-jerking drama and laugh at the comical skits, and, of course, a wonderful preacher who doesn't have a t-shirt. It'll, a church can grow as a result of people flocking to hear just an eloquent preacher who uses articulate messages that tickle the ears and numb the consciences, preachers who fail to preach against sin, pastors who fail to mention judgment of hell and the lake of fire to follow. Churches can grow numerically. Churches can fall into doing the same old thing the same old way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I hate that phrase. I, I always ask my grandpa, but well, can I make it better? Don't mess with it. And it was usually farm equipment, and he was right. Don't touch it. Donnie's going to break it. But what we need to ask in every church, how do we know when we are doing church God's way? Not the way I like, not the way you like, not the way Grandpa like, not the way that my kids like. The way that God wants church to be. And this question is going to be answered uh, throughout our rest of our journey, our crawl through the book of Acts. We're still in chapter 2, and as we look at this, we need to remember that the theme for this year is destination. Both individually, we need to set a destination of growing closer and more vibrant in our faith. We need to set and follow that destination corporately as a church of reaching new people and bringing salvation into their lives. Whenever I preach this passage, this is one of my favorite passages, Acts chapter 2, 40 through 47. I, I just have loved this because it's the building block of the church. It's the foundation. It's simple, bare bones. This is what the church should be. And I've always focused on verse 42. I'll read 42 for you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I know these are right. I know they're true. I preached on this verse several times, even a couple times here. And I thought, I've got the sermon done. I, I, I'm ready. My God, I need you to take me deeper. And so I began praying more about this and looking into this. God, I don't want to do the same fluff. I don't want to do the same thing. Show me something new in this passage that I love what this part says. And so I kept praying, and then I started reading the Scripture more and more. And so let's set the scene here. With many other words... Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. 
Those who accept his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold the property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If you want to know how the church is supposed to grow, these are the scriptures we need to look at. These are the basics because this is true church growth. People kept coming to this new church. People kept coming and they were being saved. They didn't come because of the reputation of the pastor. Peter was some uneducated fisherman. They didn't come because he was all eloquent. He was just an old fisherman. They didn't come because of some great, fantastic building. They didn't even have a building yet. They were... Um, They didn't come to a church service. They came because they heard something brand new. They were minding their own business on the day of Pentecost. There was no choir, praise team, band, no nursery, children's ministries, no singles or seniors groups. And yet, how many were added that first day? Around 3,000. Why? Why was it so many people came to salvation that day. Why did the church explode in numerical growth? And again, I always focus on verse 42, but as I kept praying and asking God, my focus changed to verse 46. We're going to impact 46 and 47 today. So let me read 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The infant church was continuing to meet. The infant church continued to meet. They were in community. Community with God and community with each other. Notice how often they were meeting. Every day. Each day they were meeting. And where were they meeting? In the temple and in their homes. The word continued here, I wanted to look that up, comes from the Greek uh, proskaterero, which means to be earnest, to persevere, to be constantly diligent in. The point is they were constantly diligent and making sure they were meeting together. They continued meeting with each other in the temple and from house to house. Now, before you think that Donnie's up here saying we all need to meet every single day, all of us together, that's not what I'm saying. More likely, they gathered together in a large group for their worship, like on Sunday in the temple, and then during the week, they had their small groups. By the way, did you know we have small groups here? You might want to get plugged into some of them. Um, a lot of the people met in those. Churches today have gotten away from this scripture. We meet once a week at least, and we're good. Some people have even said, well, I meet once a month. And it's okay. But Scripture said they were meeting all the time. The infant church shows us that how we should be meeting. Too many times we have a... Um, let's just be honest. In churches today, we smile bright, we shake a handshake or a fist bump, the voice is all warm, and then in five seconds, it's over. Our fellowship is done. Wow, how are you doing? Great. And we move on. That's how it is in many churches today. It's a five-second fellowship, one after another. But in the infant church, we see something totally different. In the first century church, they were meeting. They were meeting in the two venues, the temple and the home. And we can get the idea from the rest of Scripture that the temple part, the church building part, was not the main focus. Look what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the Scripture, that means in the temple, to preaching and to teaching. Okay, that's what we're here doing. This is an attempt at what we're doing here at St. Joe Church of Christ. But the early infant church did not just meet on Sunday morning. Acts 2.46 said, breaking of bread from house to house, right? Acts 5, which we'll get to in a few weeks, but... 
every day in the temple and from house to house they continued to teach and preach this message that Jesus is the Messiah. All throughout the rest of the New Testament, believers met together. They constantly met to, with each other in the temple, but also in homes. Acts 12, 12. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had were gathering and praying. Acts twenty twenty. I never shrank back from telling you what you need to hear, either publicly or in your homes. Paul sends greetings to the church in Priscilla and Aquila's house in Colossians 4. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and to the church that meets in her house. In Philemon 1-2, Paul sends greetings to more that are meeting in a home. This house gathering the believers occurred for four centuries before it all changed when Constantine came on the scene and legalized Christianity and they all started gathering more publicly and started having big buildings, cathedrals, and the intimacy of daily meeting with people started falling away. The first church gathered for large groups, but they also gathered to convene in small groups. We've got a youth group on Tuesday nights, and I'll tell you, that's not a real small group. There was 39 or so this last Tuesday. You want to know there are so many things pulling your kids' attention away. In this culture, they're trying to pull them there. And the more you feed Christ in them, I'm going to tell you right now, we have a great group, small group for your youth. Bring them to the youth group. We have other small groups where you can have God poured into your life, and they meet in homes, so it's more convenient and comfortable and relaxed and you can grow. Let's go back to that. Let's emphasize and do this part. Not only did the first church meet, but the infant church ate together. Okay, can I hear an amen? They ate together. Look what it says. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were eating I miss potluck dinners. Don't you? Yeah, we all do. Just so you know, we're having one coming up. Just so you know. It's just approved. It's all good. We're going to be doing it. But the first kind of eating the early church did was the Lord's Supper, breaking up bread. 1 Corinthians 11 lets us know the Lord's Supper was originally, communion was originally part of a full meal. It was meant of a time of remembering the Lord's death and His return. A uh, time of expressing love towards God and sharing that with others. Not many people need to be told that eating is important, especially to the to the church. How many people? How many? Sorry. How many church members does it take to change a light bulb? Ten. One to change it, and nine to plan the picnic to celebrate. Okay, that's what it takes. Church socials, potlucks, carrying dinners have an important function. And, and I'm going to say this, listen, for many people who attend church, those fellowship times of spending with each other at a table over food can be as important and sometimes even more important than even what was preached in the sermon. A connection with each other. There are a lot of people looking for community. They want to come to church and find that community that's going to meet that social interaction, but also a spiritual need in their life. It's even more so for our youth. Another plug here. When I was a youth minister, I tried all these different ways to try and get kids to come to church events. And do you know what the best way to get them to come? Food. Now, we had a fifth quarter party. So anytime we had a home Friday night game, we'd have a fifth quarter quarter party at the church, where I said, we're going to have all these snacks like nachos and chips and stuff like that. And one of my youth sponsors goes, I'm going to take care of food. I'm like, great. What are you bringing? She goes, spaghetti. What? Spaghetti? We're going to have spaghetti at 930 at night until midnight. That's how long they went. I'm like, sure, whatever. I don't have to deal with it. Guess what the kids loved? They didn't want my chips and brownies. They wanted spaghetti. She had went all out. Then we had be stroking off one time. She started making full meals. And you know what? We went from 40 kids to 70. 
beef stroganoff. It works. Okay? Food is essential. I have already been inundated with several of you, and one of them's wearing a special t-shirt about having a meal here in church. Food is essential. It's the, a vital part of fellowship in the church. But it's not just because we like it. It's part of the fabric of the church of meeting together, community, socializing, and bonding. So they, early church, the infant church, continued to meet. They continued to eat. And look what it says on how they ate their food. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Leads to the third part. The infant church was joyful. The Greek word for glad here is agalasius. Uh, It means much leaping. So when it said they were meeting with glad and sincere hearts, uh, it, it really should be translated as exuberant joy. Uh, the early Christians were happy, joyful. They had an exuberant attitude towards life. Why were they so joyful? Because they just found out that the Messiah they killed, the one they longed for because of their sin, had finally returned And He took their sins away. He took their sins away and He gave them freedom so that they could enter into heaven. Shouldn't we be just as joyful? Shouldn't we be just as joyful when it comes to knowing who Jesus is, our Lord and Savior? Jesus has delivered the... And I get to go to heaven because of what Jesus did. I get to... Me, I get to go to heaven. How much joyful can I get with that knowledge, with that truth? Shouldn't that be expressed, especially with other people who are going there with me? We need to be this way. The early church was joyful. The infant church was also real. It said sincere hearts. Look at that verse. They together with glad and sincere hearts. The Greek word here is freedom from duplicity. That's what that word that's translated sincere should really say. Free from duplicity, deceit, deception, or dishonesty. In other words, they were not fake. They were authentic. They were real. They did not put up a facade. They didn't try to make appearances. They did not come to impress what you see is what you get. How many of you have ever been invited to a church by someone? Hopefully it's not here. And um, you go to that church, and that person you know is all uppity up at that moment. They're wearing the suit and tie or the dress, and they're, they're speaking with more eloquent words than they did on Tuesday. And they're all acting all holy. And, and then the next week when you see them, it's all gone again. They're, they're putting on a show of religiosity. I just made that word up. I know that. No. Jerry just asked if I could spell it. You don't get the t-shirt either. Why is it we feel like when we gather with other believers, we've got to put on a show? They were meeting with glad hearts, but also authentic hearts. That means some of them were broken. Some of them were struggling with something. And you know what they did? They still met and they didn't hide it. They met so that that need, that encouragement could be met. Morning, how are you? I'm broken. I'm struggling. That's not weak. That's authentic. That's real. That's what this church did, this early church. And because of that, they grew closer together. And you know what happened? Ministry happens. Growth started happening. So they were meeting, they were eating, they were joyful, and they were real. And look what happened. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. First, here in this verse, the infant church worshipped. The early church experienced something 
that was revolutionary to that time period. They actually came to worship, not to come and sit and be told what to do and what to believe. They came and interacted with God because of what He was doing in their lives. Praise is something we give when we're pleased with something. I, we praise our dogs when they do a trick. We praise our kids for the same thing. You did the dishes. Good job. Here you go. We, we praise people when they do something good. We love to be told that we did a good job. Hence Nick and his t-shirt. We praise something we enjoy, right? When we praise God, we are telling Him we love Him. We appreciate Him. But the word praise, I just found this out, comes from the Greek root word that means to prize. Which means when we praise something, we are saying we prize it. We, we are excited about it. It is important to us to have and to hold on to. That it is valuable. So when we are worshiping God, we are saying He is an important thing that we truly love and want to have. I believe that's how the early church did it. They praised God. They prized what He was to them. They praised God in the temple and in, in their homes. But I don't believe that's where it ended. I really don't believe that's where it ended. That they, as soon as they got off the, the temple grounds or outside of that home, they're like, okay, act normal now. Because inside the temple and inside their homes, that was the normal which meant when they went out of their homes, guess what they did? They kept praising God in the community, in the marketplace. And how do I know this? Look what it said in verse 47. Praising God and linking, enjoying the favor of all the people. The favor spoken of in verse 47 wasn't favor from church members. It's not that they had a good reputation with each other. It was the infant church had a good reputation with unbelievers. The people knew, the community knew, those believers, they're real, they're authentic, they're good people. So when I got to this part of the sermon, I wanted to do a little research. Gallup poll researched America's people's confidence in institution. This is in 2019. And it has changed a little bit, but all the results aren't in, so I had to use the 2019. From top to bottom, this is how much they um, respect or have confidence in these institutions. And the list is up here. The top, 73% of Americans, uh, is it not up there? Is it up there, John? Hey, okay. <laughs> Because there's a lot here. The military, people 73% favorable towards the military. Small business at 68. The police at 53. That's one of them that's dropped quite a bit. The presidency at 38 in 2019. Again, that's dropped even more. The U.S. Supreme Court, that's dropped again, 38. The church. Wait a minute. The church is underneath these other things. The church at 36 is equal to, at this point, the medical system. Then you can go to banks, public schools, organized labor, that's like other unions, criminal justice, newspapers, big business, television at 18, and Congress at 11. This right here, this is how Americans two years ago felt about the good reputation of these institutions. This is sad. This is heartbreaking that we as a country don't even respect or honor these institutions. Look at the church. 30, 36% of the people polled had confidence that the church... I think the church has lost favor of the people. I believe a big portion of that is because the church in many areas has lost its focus. It has been more focused on maintaining the institution of the church. Many churches have made it their mission to keep the people inside the building happy. Some churches are pouring a lot of time and money into um, 
protesting sins of those people outside. They're trying to change these things and, and say it's now this way. We're going to allow this and we're no longer going to look down on this. We're going to make people feel happy and comfortable. And because of that, they have lost at being real, authentic. Too many times Christians are, oh, like my life's perfect. I love it. Nothing's wrong with my life. Liar. Because you live in a broken, fallen world. You yourself are a sinner. I struggle with sin every week. I'll tell you that right now. I struggle with sin. I hate it. I wish I could be better than that. I keep stumbling into it. It's stupid. I have Jesus who keeps fixing it. Who keeps restoring it. Who keeps forgiving me and lifting me up. So yeah, I may stumble, but I have a God who doesn't. And He's there for me. We need to be real. And we need to show that it's not perfect people that come to church. That people come to see the perfect one. I believe people have lost, uh, increasingly develop a distaste for church, not because of the actual Word of God, but because of the conduct of people who claim to be Christians. Many people who profess to know Jesus don't practice what they preach, and I'm first going to talk to the people on the pulpit with that one. We say that Jesus is love, but then we have disdain for people that we don't agree with. We say we, we need to love like Jesus, but we yet our own life is full of hypocrisy. Just like many of the people outside the church say, the church is just full of hypocrites. You're right. We are hypocrites. Let's quit changing that. We are. We say we want to honor God, but yet we don't. We're working on it. Let's actually own that. This is why many people don't venture to step foot into our churches. In, in Acts 20, in this passage here, we see a progression. Peter was preaching that sermon. He finishes it. Those who received the message, about 3,000 were saved, were baptized into Christ. These souls continued to flourish and meet together, to eat together, to fellowship together. They were worshiping God. They, they met for apostles' teaching, for breaking of bread, for fellowship and prayer. They experienced the joy of that. And they had a good reputation, not just with each other, but with those outside of the church. I can tell you something right now. I've been in churches that had a horrible reputation. People just couldn't stand them. I was in one church where people said, you go to that church? Well, yeah, I just got hired there. Good luck. They're nasty there. They're mean. Do you know most waitresses or waiters don't like to work on Sunday? Because Christians don't tip well. That's why. They don't want to deal with Christians. They'd rather work in the bar. We need to gain the favor of the people again. We need to show them that this is what we are all the time. We need to be kooky crazy, okay? Just admit it. We need to be, oh, like Nick. We need to be joyful in pointing out things and saying, you know what, it's because of God that I can live this way. It's because of God that I can have this joy in the midst of the troubles of my life. I still have God. I can face these problems because I have God. I can stand triumphantly because I have God. Let me show you God. Not my church. Not the preacher. Not the praise band. They're great. Let me show you God. Because that's, that's the transformational power. That's what the early church kept coming to. The early church, all of those things were not focused on them. They were focused on God. The early church activity included meeting, eating, being joyful, being real authentic, worshiping. They enjoyed because they were authentic. They were duplicitous. And here's the pinnacle of all these verses. Because they were focused on God in all these areas. The end of 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice what happens when the infant church kept meeting, kept eating, kept fellowshipping. They kept spending time in worship. They kept being joyful and authentic. 
They kept being real outside in the public. They kept having that good reputation. The infant church multiplied. I, I've heard people say, you know, it's sad that we only have, you know, 12 baptisms a year. You're right. It's awesome that we have 12. The Scripture says, how often did God bring salvation? When the church did those things? Don't, don't we want to multiply? I mean, I've heard some people say, I don't want the church to grow. I like it this way. It's comfortable. I know a lot of the people, and it feels good. I want heaven to be jam-packed. I want an eternity of getting to meet new people. Notice God brought growth. It wasn't the music. It wasn't the hip preacher. I had to do that. It wasn't the building. It wasn't the youth program. It wasn't the outreach programs. What brought growth? God. The church just had to do what the church was supposed to do. That's it. Then God brought growth. A few years ago, I changed my whole thinking on evangelism. After studying some things, I was like, evangelism isn't something we should focus on. I don't go out trying to evangelize people. I don't. You know what I do? I disciple somebody. A byproduct of a healthy disciple is you can't stop talking about God. I don't need to teach you how to evangelize. You will naturally talk about what you're excited about. Naturally. Go up and ask Jen about her grandkids. And an hour later, you'll still be listening. And did anybody have to teach you how to talk about your grandkids? She's excited about them. She loves them. Jerry's been talking about being married, and he's excited. He loves this. He didn't have to go to class on how to talk about your wife. Nick did. Yes, Nick did. That's right. <laughs> that was a good one. When we, <laughs> you get the shirt now. <laughs> when we are naturally excited about Christ, we automatically are real. We're automatically joyful. And God brings growth because of that. The church has to do what the church is supposed to do. Acts 2 comes to a close, yet this chapter is really just the beginning. Um, it's the beginning for the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit's going to do in and through the church. A guy named Rodney Stark wrote a book on called The, uh, the Rise of the Early Christianity. That's what he, he wrote about. Um, he wasn't a Christian. He was a professor of sociology and comparative religions at the University of Washington. And he wanted to track what made Christianity explode because it doesn't fit in human psychology. He tracked Christianity in the first 300 years of existence because he said Christianity changed the world, and it didn't make sense to him. It started with this, as he says, an obscure, small Jesus movement, and it grew worldwide. Eventually, Rome was not overthrown. Eventually, Rome became a Christian nation, he said. How did that happen? How is it that this little movement, Jesus movement, exploded and went all over the globe? Because the church at the time was living out Acts chapter 2. Even though the church had no political position, they couldn't hold office. At that time, Christians couldn't vote. They had no Bill of Rights. They didn't have kind of religious freedoms that we have. And yet, in the midst of great persecution, in the midst of all this unfavorability towards the church as a whole, the church exploded in growth. And Rodney Stark said, how did this happen? It's not because of a democratic system. They didn't have a vote to cast. They didn't have that. So how did they? How did they change the world? How did they do all that? And he traced it. And this is what he found out. This is what he found out, and this just blew my mind here. Abortion and infanticide was very common in the Roman world. It was an accepted practice. It was most often exercised when the child was female or 
had disabilities. It was perfectly common in those days. It was condoned by Plato and Aristotle to take your child that you didn't want and leave it in the woods and go back to your life. That's what was common in the first 300 years of that. Just to leave them. Virtually all disabled, deformed babies were abandoned. And if you were a girl, 50-50 chance on if you were going to have a life. And even though they didn't have a vote, even though they didn't have a political platform, the early church did not stand for that. They couldn't really control what was happening outside their community, but they could affect on what was going to be done inside their community. So the infant church, the real church, valued women and started protecting them. The infant church, the real church there, started saying, you don't want your kid, fine. we'll take them. We will find homes for them. The first orphanages and foster homes were all done by the church. They protected widows and orphans. Sounds like scripture. Especially in a, in a world where they they were not valued. The church showed value to them. Christian men were called to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which was contrary to the culture. Instead, it was like, go do whatever you want as long as you bring home some money. It's okay. And the church says, no, we're going to raise the standard to what God has called men to do. We're going to raise the standard to how women are going to react to their wife, or to their husbands and their children. They raise the standard of that. The early Roman Christians saved many hundreds and thousands of babies. The church did not need or want governmental help because they took care of of each other. They didn't just take care of each other. They started taking care of people outside of the church community, out those that they lived with, which again in that day was unheard of. You help them, you don't even know them. And the list goes on and on about how the church was radically different than the culture. And eventually society was so struck by what was happening within the community called the church that the church exploded and started changing the culture. So here's my question. What would happen if the church was just the church? As we just looked at, devoted to teaching, preaching, prayer, fellowship, what would happen if the church kept meeting, kept eating, kept fellowshipping, experiencing happiness, and kept being real? It would start building a good reputation once again. And we would see God bringing more and more people to salvation. If the church was the church, we did a better job of caring for the sick. If the church was the church, church and marriages were honored, and there was complete commitment that Scripture talks about of what intimacy and love actually should look like, we would see couples trying to live as God has called them and other people saying, I can help you. I can guide you. I can support you. If the church was really the church, cared for orphans and foster children and single moms more effectively, we would see the abortion rate drop. If the church was the church and ensured that they, they were not hungry people among us, that people were learning to take care of themselves as somebody walked with them and provided the needs and information we wouldn't need welfare anymore, or even food stamps. You have to ask yourself, if the world changing things in our culture could be and should be affected by our church. Maybe if there was a... Um, here's what Franklin Roosevelt said. I think it'll be up there. You have to ask yourself if that would change things in our culture in a more dramatic way. I seriously doubt that there is a problem, political or economic, that would not melt before the fire of a spiritual awakening. It's not bold, so it's not up there. Franklin Roosevelt said this world, this country, would be changed by a spiritual awakening. Jesus did not call us to condemn culture. He did not call us to go out there and say, culture is doomed and going to hell. He called us to go out and redeem it. 
to go out there and say, in spite of your failures, let me tell you about Jesus. In spite of you doing something wrong, let me tell you about Jesus so he can come alongside you and save you from this crooked and deprived generation, which is what Peter was preaching. This culture today hates marriage. It does. This culture today hates family values. This culture today hates Christianity. And I think it's time we show them what it's supposed to be like. Not some of the examples that we've seen in other churches. I'm a broken man. I'm a sinful, broken man. So are you. You're sinful and broken. And yet, we can gather here. We can have joy. We can have true fellowship. We can make fun of each other. Because we're standing on the same foundation as Christ. And I can say this. People have been hearing about St. Joe. We don't do a lot of advertisements. We do a little bit on Facebook, but we don't do a lot. And yet I meet people in Fort Wayne or in Angola, and they're like, oh, I've heard a lot about St. Joe. St. Joe? We don't have a stoplight. How do you hear about our church? And you know what I've noticed all of them say? Well, I was talking to somebody who knows someone there. Which proves good Christians don't shut up. It's true. You need to speak up. You need to talk about it. Yeah, there's something cool going on at our church. Yeah, we've got this going on. Oh, we just saw this event. We just saw this family transform. You should see what God's doing. And when we do that, we are living Acts 2 here. And God will bring daily those who will be saved. Jesus didn't call us to condemn the culture, but to redeem it. And the church is the vehicle that can travel out into the culture and bring that message. But only if we're willing to live and act like the church. Like the church here described in Scripture. The book of Acts is actually a revolution. It's a revolution of what believers should be like. Not one that advanced by physical force, but by spiritual force. Righteous, powerful force of the Holy Spirit. Acts is history, but it's also a foundation for how we need to live and move. It's a story waiting to be revealed, not just in the past, but in our culture, our time right now. There is so much against us right now in our world. I'm tired of the negativity of it. I am. I'm tired of all the things that are trying to hurt and invade and divide. So I'm going to take my eyes off that and quit sinking in the storms of this world and keep my eyes focused on the one who stands true no matter what happens in this world. I want to invite you to do the same, but not individually, corporately, as a church. It said they met together and sold things if somebody had need. We have people in this church who are willing to help. I keep getting asked, hey, do you know somebody in need? I'd like to help them. The the only way they can is if you say, I need help. Because then the church can say, great, then we can fulfill that. Be real, be authentic. I I need help with this. I need, great, the church is going to be there. I guarantee it. That's why we've got a couple bags or something back there for people to bring in. They need help. So who's willing to say, I want to be the church? I want to be what this scripture is declaring. I want to be what God has declared. This is the church. Not a Sunday morning gathering, but a mountain of God's force ready to ride into this world. The church is not supposed to be a hospital where we just come in here. It needs to be an advancement into the the kingdom of darkness. I want to be planted next to the gates of hell and snatching people out of there so that they can go the other way back to heaven. I don't want to be secluded over here going, well, good luck. We need to advance as the church, and this is how we do it. So if you're willing, we stand and do it. And as we come, as we now stand to get ready to worship again our God and our Savior, let us lift up that message. And if you need to talk to one of us, again, I'll meet you in the back room. Um, The elders can. We can pray with you and see where God can move you. 
and the church can support you.